Hello everybody and welcome back to the Two Narrows Podcast. I am your host, James Leonard, joined as always by my good friend Timmy Lowe. Hey everyone. It's our first podcast after being off for a few weeks for the summer, on Darryl, Tim. That's it. And it's an enjoyable but rainy summer. Very, very, rainy very summer. wet summer. Yeah, yeah. It's a balls, but uh, we've got a couple in the studio today, one at a time we're going to do, because two very interesting guests. The first one up is Niall. You're a psychotherapist. You're from Toron. I am originally from Tyrone, yeah, yeah. Tell us about Tyrone. I was like growing up up there. Uh, Tyrone, great spot. I'm the I'm the youngest of three, uh, mm-hmm. so I have two elder sisters, and then mom and dad. We really grew up in Cookstown. Uh, mom and dad, I suppose, to give them a shout out. They're married fifty years. We were down. Congratulations! In, yeah. uh, congratulations, Nora and Brenton. That's a few yeah. brownie points. Favorite child. Yeah. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> but I uh, Cookstown was. Uh, I had a f- fantastic upbringing and I know that comes up a lot on the podcast. There's no all good and all bad, yeah. but with hindsight, standing there, you know, over the weekend with my family and, you know, cousins and everyone doing well, I thought it really has been idyllic. And I suppose as a psychotherapist saying, you know, what is yeah. behind the veil, like yeah. really I have absolutely no complaints. Um, it was grand. I went to, uh, I went to Anakmore Primary. My mum was actually taught me. So my mum and dad are retired teachers. Played Ga for Father Rocks, went to St. Mary's and had a fantastic time there in Maharfelt. And um, yeah, it was really a, a wonderful upbringing. Mm-hmm. I, I was a happy lad. And I suppose as you get more into it, don't you, you realize that it's all about individuating from the path that you've been mm-hmm. given. So I started, I went to Queen's to do dentistry, but I'm... <laughs> I'm a million miles away from that in one. Yeah, like yeah, I say, I'm yeah. only six inches down. <laughs> spent from <laughs> or up from yeah. teeth to brain. So do you know when you were growing yeah. up in uh, County Tyrone? Yeah, it sounds like you had a nice childhood. But you know, like a lot of areas in Northern Ireland, uh, there'd be an undercurrent of trauma uh, and stuff in the community. Was that yeah. like in like that in your community, or are you a bit removed from that? I suppose it's context, you know, because whenever there's and maybe people listening can relate to this is you're always thinking, ah, but we didn't have it that bad, you know, but it's compared to what? Compared to, the, you know... How far are you from Oma? I we t- oh, 20 miles, just down the road. So, I like, I lived in the shadow of, a, of an army base, you know what I mean? I knew when there was a click on the line and there was a wee latency that our calls were being listened. So, you know, it's only now that I have a wee man and we're in Australia, and I'm like, a lot of the shit that we... There's a difference between something being normal and normalised. Yeah. So, as I, I said to my dad there, I said... You give us the most, and mum as well, the most idyllic childhood under those yeah. circumstances. That's it, mum. So, yeah, so um, I think there's a lot of people had it a lot worse, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there was a sort of an ambient background noise of, of trouble. Mm, yeah. and that's why it's called the trouble. So yeah, it, yeah. it builds a sort of a resilience at the individual and the societal level. But, I mean, I've had a bit of work to do to be like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, sort of, kink out all those wrinkles to be and I still struggle am I a wee bit hyper vigilant about things yeah and I've made a very active effort I think living in Australia to say I'm not going to live like that because I don't live in Northern Ireland in you know the tail end of the troubles anymore I'm in this and that's a big part of trauma work that I do is to say it is not then it is now <laughs> you know so the rules don't necessarily what was adaptive in the past is not yeah, so yeah. But it is, isn't it great uh, to understand yeah what hyper vigilance is no. and to understand where it may have came from and you you obviously understood that yeah, yeah but you can imagine the amount of people up there that have maybe they've never done any form of work on themselves mm-hmm. to understand why they behave yeah, in certain yeah. ways or why they're so anxious or why they're so mm-hmm. fearful but when somebody understands that they're hyper vigilant from mm-hmm. their background, mm-hmm. they can then start doing the work of themselves, yeah, and understanding, yeah. and then working on how ways of changing mm-hmm. the hyper vigilance. Yeah, can you give us a few ideas, maybe how people could change that? Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, just ones that come to mind for me now personally is I remember when I it's it's scrutinizing the stories that you tell yourself that are often bullshit you know they're post hoc yeah. rationalizations to clear away something so when I moved to Australia for the first couple of years I would never have worn um, uh, what they call thongs but that's flip flops which yeah. I consist in calling them flip flops yeah know. actually yeah, you know, <laughs> different day <laughs> <day or, laughs> <that's laughs> <that's laughs> this podcast is going off yeah, go it's going it's going off piece very yeah, soon would you call it a tongue in Australia <laughs> they do I, I insist on calling it flip flops yeah. yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. so 
<laughs> you know, for the first couple of years, I'd be, ah, I don't really like the style of them. And then something happened as a different story, but it'll show, it'll hopefully feed back into that. My sister, Ashling, they were in London and there was some bomb scare, right? So it happened recent, you know, recently enough. My mum asked her, she said, when you ran across the bridge, because the cops said, you know, you got to go, did you take your shoes off? She said, no, nah, no, nah, I ran in my stilettos. And she looked at her like, rookie mistake. Do you know what I mean? Mm, yeah. And I realised in that moment, I thought, ah, one of the reasons that I don't like to wear those is, and this is a hypervigilance thing, yeah. because you don't want to be the bloke who can't run. run or, you know, fight or sort shit out. Yeah, you know, you yeah, think, yeah. well, I've just copped out now. I'm in my... You're, you have to I'm be always be prepared. You know what I mean? And then you just think, mm. right, let's, let's put that relative to the situation that you're in. How likely is that something's going to kick off at this beach party? Yeah. Very unlikely. So <laughs> what was adaptive... Yeah. Do you know what I mean? What was adaptive uh, yeah. in that time is not adaptive anymore. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, so I'll do little things for myself to say, to just scrutinize and, and check in with my body and say, okay, you know, w w are, you, are, you, are you well calibrated to the risk that you're in? And, and that's, that's just practice, practical solutions to emotional problems. Yeah. But so I don't you, think, I don't yeah. think like it would ever like uh, completely leave you because yeah. me, me and Timmy spoke about this yeah. a lot of times. Yeah. But I have this thing still to this day. Yeah. I could be standing in the queue in the coffee shop. Uh, yeah, I walk yeah. my dog through the park yeah. on a lovely day yeah. and I get this feeling that yeah. somebody's going to come up behind me and hit me with a bow. Yeah. Something very violent. Somebody's going to get out of the car and yeah. hit me with a machete or somebody's just going to hit, hit sucker punch me or I can't see. Mm -hmm. Then I, I follow up like, James, you're a very far move now from that lifestyle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know what I mean? There's so many years away, but it's still that thought still comes in. Totally, yeah. But it doesn't consume me at all. No, not at all. But do you know what it brings it back to? In straight away when you said it, you you drop straight into your body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because the body is like the, your man's book, Bessel van der Kolk's yeah. book. The body keeps the score. Totally, yeah. And when 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 he says the body keeps the score, the body keeps the emotion that trapped emotion from that experience of fear, shame guilt whatever it may be and it's trapped in here you can understand in, a, in an intellectual level mm. of what's going on for you but you have to also work on how you might be able to free yourself from that trapped energy mm -hmm. that's within your body mm -hmm. you know because yeah. it will always be there mm -hmm. you know something will trigger it a place a smell a sound a, a name and when it triggers that memory Mm -hmm. Like it, that emotion will come straight into your body, mm -hmm. and what people don't understand is they can know all the education about all this stuff and understand that it's a traumatic experience from childhood. But what people, where people are really stuck, is this here. They still feel it, and 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 it's so strong within their bodies. It's like yeah. Jesus, I've been going to this psychotherapist for the last four years, and now I know why I I, I feel like the way I do. Mm -hmm. But I still feel like shit. I still feel yeah, like yeah. worthless. I still feel shame mm -hmm. from that thing or fear from this thing. You know, like how do people actually move from that? Because mm -hmm. that, for me, the way I moved away from that, and it's not about moving away from it fully. It's about accepting it as a part of the yeah, whole I am. Like, it being in my body. But it's also about moving into it, failing it, and leaving that energy move up. Mm -hmm. up your body and and when i'm meditating and if something comes up for me i go into it i feel it and I, I don't react to it and when i don't react to things in my normal day life a circumstance or, or, or somebody gives me shit or road rage or whatever the fuck it may be when i don't react to it and i feel i feel a rush of energy pumping straight up through my body and it's like i'm releasing mm -hmm. a fear are, are a bit of anxiety and it's gone you know and that's there from something that may have happened in the past yeah and you know? in a way it sort of it doesn't really matter you know where it came from because mm -hmm. that's in the past it's more what is your body doing right now mm -hmm. so i think some people get maybe are hearing about the the journey into being like a curious detective about what's actually going on for you at the level of your body and they think ah that's that's you're just going to get bogged down in the weeds and you know how could we know what happened and sure oh everybody has trauma now and i do think the term sometimes gets a wee bit overused but my point is to bring people back to the present moment good quality therapy is about helping you to function well in the here and now whatever that might be and broadly speaking for me there's two components one is insight but and that is your more 
not box standard, but the more working through stuff, developing maybe the psychoeducation, mm. understanding the terminology. Knowing your triggers just, and things like that. Knowing your triggers, just the more practical thing, setting up your life, understanding the basics, the, just the, the rudimentaries of, of therapy and having those little light bulb moment, moments. But as they say in, in recovery, and is insight will avail you nothing. Mm. So it's not enough. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. So you have to have the insight. So that's one piece of it. And then the next piece of it is this is whether people like it or not, is to see how that maps onto their being, their mind, their body and their soul in that moment. And that could be checking your heart rate mm. after you get the email and going, like, it's not lying to me, you know, this or your watch. Yeah, my uh, systolic pressure is, you know, or my BPM is a wee bit higher. Like you know, it's like Shakira right. says the hips don't lie, you know, the body doesn't lie to you. It's telling you, you know, listen to me, listen to me. And then if you can find a way and we can talk about some, unpack some of the ways that I find to be, you know, more, you know, the sort of toolkit that I've developed professionally and personally, what is the tool for the job so that you can calm yourself down, so that you can come back into your body. And it, for me, it's all about functioning in the moment mm -hmm. as best as you possibly can. It's not doing the bit, you know, it's not an infinite regress towards perfectionism in the future. And I one day I'd be perfect, nor is it this constant infinite regress towards, you know, well, I just need to talk about my childhood until the cows come home. It's yeah. about bring it back to the moment. You've got the insight, you've developed that. How are you going to superimpose your capacity to be more centered as a person so that you can be a better boss, employee, wife, husband, whatever the case mm. may be. So my, my focus is very much on practical solutions yeah. to emotional yeah. problems. And what you said is very important. It's about understanding the, the actual education side of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the, all the, the terminology. And when you do understand it and you understand how it works and why you feel the way you do, you have to kind of sit with it then. Mm -hmm. And you made a point there about the, your, your blood pressure and your heart rate mm -hmm. and stuff. I'll give you an example of it. Mm -hmm. This morning, I got up, I got up in the morning early and at half past five this morning, my my heart rate during meditation was 60, 62, really low, very, very relaxed. And I got up then afterwards, about after a meditation, about quarter past six, half six, and I checked the watch and there was a spike in my heart rate when I was going through my emails on the on yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. It was like we went from 62 down here when I was in a really relaxed, accepting state to when I was looking at the emails and going through them and fucking noticing how many emails need to be looked at, this email, that email. Yeah. And it was like, I was, I was looking at her afterwards about seven or half, seven, I was a cup of tea with my wife at the table and I was looking at this and I said, holy shit, this is after, it spiked because of the activity that I was doing. Right. You know, it's so true, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think nice. one on that, um, if we're, I think a wee golden nugget that I don't know who told me once was the notion of having a digital Sabbath. Having a day when you don't look at any, you know, yeah. you don't look at anything like that because in the past there was an off switch for that and we don't need to tell parents just about how intrusive screens are to to children but i think a lot of the focus gets put on oh you know screen time for kids yeah. <laughs> most, most adults these days they might not be watching you know like bluey or whatever but they are looking at screens all through their day yeah. and and there are people far smarter than me whose job it is is to is to basically push those buttons mm. to create a sense of urgency or fear because you know those are the things which which activate you in a particular way but the collateral damage is your well-being yeah so really i look at when people are looking at screens a lot they don't give themselves any any break from that you know you, you wouldn't do and you wouldn't treat a machine that way you wouldn't say well we're just going to run the printing press you know seven days a week and there'll be no issues yeah. Obviously, we just, yeah. well, have you any advice for somebody and i can be this person yeah. on any given day where you're so consumed mm -hmm. by the screen in terms yeah. of what Timmy's talking about their email like we're in the media business sure sure yeah digital audio multimedia social yeah. media is a big part of what we do yeah but even to just put away the phone for five or ten minutes it's like it's very difficult to do yeah. and to just sit there and do nothing and be silent it's like your body wants a distraction because it's uncomfortable you know somebody in the basic states mm -hmm. that now what kind of tips or mm -hmm. practical things could they do there yeah I think it's it's meeting yourself where you are really isn't it so the tr trial this let's say you're you're in the course of your life you're going to be early for something you're meeting your friend for coffee and you know they're a few minutes late <laughs> the instinctive reaction is that the phone's going to come out 
Now, in the past, when phones were first new, you would have felt like nobody likes to stand out. You know, that's just a that's just a cultural norm across the com the world. Now, if you're the fella at the coffee shop, he's there on his own. He doesn't have his phone out. People are looking. You know, who's that fucking psychopath? Exactly. <laughs> he's looking at a tree. You know. Uh, so, create those little moments of of un un discomfort. So it could be you say you meet someone. I'll meet you at eleven for coffee, and you get there at ten fifty-five, and you don't whip the phone out. You know, so it's manageable because you know, well, even if he's he or she's mm -hmm. late, I'll I'll only have to do. But it's to Timmy's point. It's to to actually then go. I am going to. I'm not going to. I'm not going to then scroll through the shite in my own head because people will be like, well, I'm scrolling through it here, but I'll scroll through it in my mind. I'm just going to not really think about anything. I'm going to sit here and feel uncomfortable. Yeah. And that is just one little example, but. That's a trailhead for what I found to be the core element of what it is to move into more comfort, and that is you have to voluntarily mm. and incrementally, so you know, in a, in a sort of gradual way, expose yourself to something that you are not comfortable with. Yeah. So for a lot of people, uh, they're the new cigarettes. Yeah. You know, a lot of cigarettes get smoked because people have got nothing to do with their hands. So yeah. I think okay. there is something in our pockets now that is, you know, sits in our breast pocket. It used to be the fags, and they were bad for our lungs, but. That's as bad for your soul in a certain way. So I think create little moments of discomfort around your technology where you don't have it. Yeah. And then the goal, obviously, like if you were progressive weight training, is to say, well, you know, this time I'm going to not have it till lunchtime or whatever the case may be. And yeah. I think it's just to, like you've done, is to not have your first hour of the day in front of a screen. Yeah. I don't think that's, I think there's plenty of other people much more, uh, you know, versed in this than I am, but your first hour of the day, you give yourself some non-screen privilege yeah. and then you answer your emails and you'll answer yeah. them better anyway. Yeah, but I think for any, any type of growth, you kind yeah. of need to make yourself uncomfortable. Yeah. Like if you're getting up at 5am and going in for a cold shower mm -hmm. or if you're going into the gym, as you said, and yeah. you're pushing really heavy weights, mm -hmm. there's, you know, like that, there's things I'm very good at making myself with no problem making yeah, yeah. uncomfortable, mm -hmm. like the gym and pushing yourself and really, you know, working hard. And then there's other times where it's not so easy, you know, but mm -hmm. you, you, I suppose, the way the Western society is, it's about making life as, as comfortable as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The voice for everything to totally. make it comfortable. Yeah. But like, it's not really healthy for you though. Nah, no, nah, no. Nah. I think change equals stress and convenience is a killer. So if you keep those two things in your head, when you go, oh, I've got this new machine and it saves me five seconds to do it. It's like, what is yeah. it really saving you, you know? So creating a wee bit of nudging yourself towards discomfort, whether that's physically or that's what you have to do in the gym to, to get stronger. So why would it be any different in your own mind? You have to nudge yourself towards wee bits of manageable discomfort throughout your day. And around technology, I think we all have to have that personal conversation. You know, and I want to speak from experience yeah. here. Um, my small lad, he's 12. Aye. And the phone is a big deal yeah. at home. Yeah. Right. And I give him a, a limited amount of screen yeah. time. And um, if he goes over it, we'll take that screen time from the next days. You know, and before that, it was really bad, and we decided to just take the phone off him Aye. for a while, give him a few days, and just explain something. So this is what I done. I took the phone off him, and I sat him down every day, and I says, can you feel the urge to have the phone at mm -hmm. the moment? And that is like, can you feel it? that it's so necessary to have the phone, the strength of it. And he's saying, yeah, I never felt like, but that's the phone. It's an addictive piece of equipment in your hand. Like, and it's like, when you don't have it, you feel like there's something missing. You know, and he started to understand it. And then there was other times, like when he got the phone back and he was still going over the, the screen time and I take the phone and I can, I say, can you feel the urge now for the phone again? Mm -hmm. And it's like it's important for a parent particularly because i i was inside in town the other day and I, I, we're all guilty of this right this child must have been i'd say anything between 12 to 18 months mm -hmm. and she, they were inside in the buggy with their two hands on the phone and they were working the phone yeah. watching cartoons yeah and i was like Fuck. it took me probably 12 months to understand how do you what the right buttons on a phone yeah. are mm -hmm. but we're and but it's it's very important for for parents and and also society to understand as well that these are the times that we live in as well. Oh, and like I I want to make it very clear yeah. as well that I I'm I'm, I'm no expert yeah. on that yeah. because we I've my <laughs> we have a two and a half year old yeah. boy and, and I have to be very honest here because my wife's in the room so she would soon tell you if yeah. I was talking nonsense. But occasionally you know when we were tr on holidays recently you know 
you find like I don't have anything in my toolkit beyond this screen yeah. and then I'm not looking forward to taking it off them. So I think for I do not need to tell people in, in recovery yeah. that, you know, it's it's the same beast that's just got different fur. So I think it's to be wary yeah. and to understand that it's like the work that I do now, I'm, I'm a behavior support practitioner, so I'm looking for functionally equivalent behaviors, you know, and this overlaps with a lot of uh, addictions work. People who have experienced something which is very profound, if you're if you're thinking you're going to swap that out and the brain's going to take something less profound, less enjoyable, less engaging, and that's going to be sustainable, you're absolutely dreaming. So I will sort of tell parents who ask me about screen time, right, you're against screen time. That's Grant. We get that. We all are. We've seen the evidence. The jury's out, you know, not out anymore. But what are you for? So what are you putting in front of them whereby within half an hour they're going to be wanting to do that instead? So that's sort of where my mind's going for my wee man mm, in the future. Yeah. And for me, it'll be, he loves, he's, he's a ball sport mad. So I'll be thinking, what is going to engage the hooks in his brain more that I think is wholesome and healthy and going to be it's expensive like, it's like, it, you know, in addiction recovery, yeah. recovery, your life and recovery has yeah. to be better quality oh, right. than addiction. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just sitting there and you're not stoned. Yeah. But your life is still shit. You're yeah. better off probably mm-hmm. getting stoned. Yeah. Because if you give up drinking drugs and it's just sitting around, no money, no skills, qualifications, no partner, you're sitting around. It's like, that's a terrible existence. Yeah. Your life and recovery has to be better. Mm-hmm. So then it, all of a sudden the drugs don't look so appealing. That mm-hmm. doesn't happen overnight. It happens with therapy, mm-hmm. doing courses, getting some work experience, making connections, having opportunities, mm-hmm. having goals something to work towards. And over time, your life, your quality of life gets better. Maybe you start earning some money, you get a relationship, and all of a sudden the drugs don't look so appealing. Yeah. But if you if you just stop using drugs and just stay stagnant, or look you're, and you'll fall flat in your face eventually. Totally. I mean, what did I ask you, lads, a question? What in the early phase, what what scratched the itch that you know that that was in spitting distance of the feelings that you you got from it? Like what what was what worked for you guys? The gym. Uh, going to the gym every day and going yeah, yeah. to narcotics anonymous yeah. meetings for me. Yeah. Having the social like like having a social life that didn't involve drinking drugs. Yeah. Going for coffee, having a laugh with mm-hmm. the lads, going for a game of pool, mm-hmm. meeting up. Mm-hmm. That's that sustains you. Yeah, totally. I'd say for now, uh, I'd love to do it for you, Tim, but th- this is yeah. like your pub in a way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. For for me it was yeah, probably a little bit the same, a bit of soccer. Uh, yeah. I spent the first few years of my rec- early yeah. recovery in prison. So it was it was soccer, um, trying to get back into education mm-hmm. and um meditation, mm-hmm. even though it was a chore at the start, it was one of the most difficult things in my life. Um it wasn't easy. No. recovery is not easy. No. And I'm gonna tell you straight up, it's not easy. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter who you are. If you want a real beneficial recovery, it's not easy. Mm-hmm. And that means Doing everything that's important, yeah. Like that's about going to your meetings, right? When your head tells you stay home, yes. go and watch the telly, yeah, yeah. Because your head will tell you, "Are you don't need it today?" Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Can't trust that yeah, bastard yeah, yeah, for yeah, a few weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go to your meetings, therapy. Yeah. It was vital, and I always say this to anybody I'm ever working with: it's grand to do your twelve steps and all the stuff with A and N A and all these other things. But there's an outside source as well. You have to understand why you drank. You know, you're not going to be able to do all this on your own. And I also try to explain and, and to people to understand the connection between your thoughts to your memory to your body and how you can snowball if you don't catch it immediately mm-hmm. and understand how it works. How a thought goes back to the memory. The memory brings up the emotion. And with that emotion, if it's fear, we'll have more thoughts around fear and we have the snowball effect. Mm-hmm. If you don't catch that immediately and be still and feel whatever's going on for you, you could spend a day, a week, a month in, in, in that state of being. Mm-hmm. And that's what I try to explain. That's the other stuff outside of recovery. That's the main, for me, that was the game changer in my mm-hmm. life. It was understanding the process of that how that works. And when I understood that, and it took me a long, long time because I had to stop the fight within me, that fighter mentality, when I got it mm-hmm. and I seen the break, the gap, you had it was, it was yeah. like, oh my God. You can never lose it 
I never lost it, but every once in a while I'd have a break away. I wouldn't be meditating as as much as I I did back then, and the gaps would be bigger, not bigger as in like bigger, but I wouldn't I w- it wouldn't be as strong as it would if I meditate an hour two hours a day, mm-hmm. you know. So that was massively beneficial, and wood carving nice. kept my mind busy. Yeah, yeah. The wood carving, I'd be there focused on it. I have ADHD as well, yeah. right? And when ADHDers find something that they love, yeah, do, yeah, yeah, and get hyper focused on it, completely yeah, yeah. zoned in. And yeah, I'd yeah. spend, I could spend eight to ten hours yeah. a day carving a yeah. ball because well, I was zoned in, and they'd be trying to bait me out of the classroom. Yeah. Do you know what? I'd be bringing the balls into the cells with me, and I'd be signing them and everything. <laughs> You know, it was that kind of hyper I was just hyper attentive to this stuff and I stuck with it, you know, and, and that got me through it. And I was in a lot of pain. I was in a lot of emotional pain. I was going through a lot because I was all the stuff that was bottled down by drinking drugs flooded up and it just came all at once. That combination of childhood trauma and undiagnosed, especially the hyperactive yeah. ADHD, yeah. that's a pretty ex- explosive one because. Yeah. If the child, which nobody does, had nothing coming bubbling up from the past to to create that vigilance, that need to constantly move, yeah, you'd still have the need to move that was just naturally, you know, yeah. in your in your system as well. And I actually I was recently diagnosed with ADHD yeah. myself. Yeah. So uh, that's been a bit of a journey for me. And there'll be people now listening. I'm not, you know, this is the first time I've ever spoken about it publicly, but. Uh, I, it, for me, it was a blessed relief to get that. And I went through it properly, mm. got, you know, did all the forms, everything. Um, research is me search. So, you know, working in this industry, I yeah, think yeah. The, the question is, you know, therapists, it's not, are you, ma- it's not, are you a wee bit mad as a box of frogs? Mm-hmm. It says, in, in what way are you? Yeah. <laughs> and also, something I, has to draw you into this lane. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, if you don't like houses, you're not going to be a real estate agent, yeah. you know, so you have to, you have to sort of have some sense. Of, of what's making you tick because I actually think it's made me a, a better therapist to be honest but to, to, to your point that has been a bit of a journey and has helped me to have more compassion for myself mm-hmm. and also to not try and bullshit people because like the moments when people come with a diagnosis and diagnosis, pro- diagnosis is a problematic term that's a whole different podcast but <laughs> when people say to someone, you know, on the belt and say, here, lad, you know, I just want to tell you I have ADHD, they all have to go keep a straight face because yeah. they know. Yeah. Everybody, you're often the last person to know the thing that you're yeah, yeah. circling around. Yeah. yeah. So um, for me, I realized, I give myself a pat on the back because I thought, I have actually developed, or without knowing it, a fair amount of tools which get within spitting distance of mm. the medication. I trialed it for a while and thought, you know the hyper focus piece, yeah. and I know that's my superpower. So I look, I think of myself I have a Ferrari brain, but I had bicycle brakes. Yes. So now I'm just trying to constantly upgrade those mm. brakes. So think about it like you have strengths, but you do have challenges, and you have to acknowledge those because the rest of the world is going to tell you. Yeah. And if you don't have that insight, the rest of the world is is going to get pissed off at you because mm. you can't, can't get the help. Stand and yeah. it's like my wife at home. Yeah. She'll tell me to do yeah. things a million times, uh-huh. and. Because I don't do it every time, um, she thinks that I'm doing it because I don't give a damn. Yeah, yeah. But the reality of it is, I actually forget. Yeah, yeah. You get and it. I, it's like I don't look at these small things and think that, oh, if I don't do that, no, no I just kind of take it in the moment. Mm-hmm. Like, it, like I'd be super sensitive in one way. Yeah. But then, like, in another way, then I can. Like, I just live every day as it is. Yeah. Every moment as it is. I don't be forecasting about next week. Today is today, and that's it. I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow because I look at it tonight, you know. Whereas my wife is, she's looking at it in two weeks' time, and she's she's managed, she's organised. Mm-hmm. But I think it's a great quality that I'm not worried as much, but then again, mm-hmm. the sensitive side of it is, I'd be much more sensitive than other people would when stuff happens. Yeah, yeah. And you're, I, I'd be much more connected to the emotional aspect as well, even though for years I was completely you, cut off. It was there, you just, you just, it was like, yeah. it was like on the other side of the River Lee, you just didn't have a bridge to it. It doesn't mean it wasn't, that bank yeah. wasn't there, you just had yeah. no access. Yeah. It was still impacting you. Yeah. I, um, yeah, with that piece, I'd say for every part 
of the challenge that comes with, and it is a neurodevelopmental disorder and it has a genetic component and it is amenable to medication and loads of behavioral strategies. So if people are thinking, I wonder do I have it? And there's a whole cultural pushback. Ah, you know, it's overdiagnosed. I think it was underdiagnosed for a long time. There's probably a pretty constant percentage of the population that has it. Mm. And it, like any of these things, it is certainly with its strengths, but you do have to own, accept, and manage the challenge. Just playing the, yeah. you know, uh, sort of push back against the world because they're not yeah. paving the way uh, for you. But the flip side of that sensitivity, which is real, and in my line of work, I work with autistic kids and often they have an ADHD diagnosis. So it was very eye-opening to me, guys, to say, asking their parents on a daily basis, you know, what's really causing you and the family system more hassles? And it was ADHD. That mm -hmm. took me by surprise. Mm -hmm. But the the maybe the dark side of it, the challenges of the emotional dysregulation piece, on the other side, I think it's probably helped you to be to be able to drop in and feel, you know, yeah. you're obviously got some proclivity and skill towards meditation mm -hmm. and that sort of side of things. So, and as much as you might feel, oh, I'm feeling things a bit too much over here, as long as you have tools to manage that, you might notice things that other people don't and check in with people where the other fellow's like, oh, you know, yeah. you're, you're, I just describe it as your parameters are better. You're going to feel all the things yeah. and just manage it in both ends mm -hmm. and understand that uh, it's your job to to tilt things more towards the strengths. Right. Did you say earlier on you were um, you you work with people that were high performing people? Yeah. So my my current role, I, I, one of the jobs that I do now, I'm a psychotherapist, and I'm working more with people, I suppose, with who are interested in non ordinary states of consciousness to improve their performance. Explain that to me. Non ordinary states. Uh, Sounds like stoned. <laughs> it's like a fancy term. Oh, he's he's not stoned. He's just in a non ordinary. Yeah. State, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, a few of the people in the dictionary will be using that. Like, oh, <laughs> telling their probation. I'm, I'm, I just <laughs> did non fucking yeah. whatever it is. Well, I use that term because I think the, the, one of my areas of interest is psychedelics, and you'll be chatting to, to my wife a fair bit more about that psychedelic assisted psychotherapy and in psychedelic integration. I don't like that there's this term that there's you know, all these weird and wonderful states of consciousness. And then there's, you know, good old fashioned, the, the proper state of consciousness. There's ordinary state of consciousness, which is often nothing to write home about. That's when you're in your head, usually tilts more negatively. The world, according to me, you're telling the, yourself the same old rigid bullshit story. And then there are moments where you break through and you have something which is a non-ordinary state of consciousness. So that could be through breath work, meditation, you know, clinical hypnosis, which is what I use, or psychedelics or prayer. It doesn't really matter, but it's understanding that there's more to the story that I tell myself about my, the, the world, my own body and my feelings and everybody else. So helping people make paradigm shifts away from the story that they're stuck in is what I do. And that's been the through line through all of my work and hypnosis for people who are particularly hypnotizable is very useful for people who have social anxiety, who maybe have got to a certain point in their career but want to break through to the next level. And often it does mean that they have to, they stay for the high performance and then they, they come for the high performance and stay for the trauma, if I'm honest, because uh -huh. they realize, actually, this, this goes back a bit further than I might have yeah. thought. But I like goal-oriented therapy so that, so that I can hold myself accountable. Because if you come to me and you say, look, I want to increase my salary or, you know, have, you know, score better on the, on the, you know, with a round of golf or, or do whatever the case may be, you and I have agreed upon a quantifiable metric and my goal is to make myself obsolete in three to six months. And if I haven't, I'm like, find some, you know, find somebody else. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Because putting, you lads have talked about having the podcast and different projects. I think if you have challenges of any description, you do need to have structure. You do need to have goals in front of you and you do need a team of people around you who are going to hold you accountable mm -hmm. and act as both guides and, and mentors. So that's sort of where my, my therapy comes in. What's the profile of a typical client? I like conscious to, you know, if you conscious, uh, uh, you don't want to be exposing anybody. I, I would sort of, like, it'd, it'd be like, would it, would it be like working like successful professional people? I like, and I have two jobs. My day job in behavior support is more working with family systems that are struggling, bit of dysfunction going on. So that's yeah. nine to five. But then I see clients for telehealth on it in the evenings. And they're more people who have all the things, you know, uh, so successful from the outside. 45 year old, you know, um, row of kids, everything's, you know, all like a bank commercial, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. And really, it's not until something, what I, something shudders that view 
And there's, there's lots of different types of rock bottom yeah. or, or, or feeling that that's coming. So it could be someone's there, everything's perfect, and then maybe their partner dies and all of a sudden they'll just they fall apart or they realize that they've only got to a certain level but the thing that's getting in their way is nobody else but them so the thing that they've been running away from their whole lives mm -hmm. that feeling of emptiness inside has not been satisfied by all of the things that they thought it would and sometimes the wheels come off a wee bit only after the success has been achieved i'm sure it happens for people relapsing yeah. once the six on paper you say well what have you got to complain about but yeah they got the thing that they thought would make them feel whole and it yeah. didn't yeah do you know do you know what you're just talking yeah. about um i believe we all hit this, this period of our lives where we just wake up one day and we feel there's something missing. You know, yeah. it, it can't be all about this. What age bracket would a lot of your clients be men and women? Like yeah. what like it's my understanding that men really kind of hit the 30, 35, they kind of mature. Yeah, yeah, mature yeah, yeah. Start waking up a small bit. Not all men. Sure. Do you know? But <clears throat> for men and women, what's what's the age bracket that they say is right? There has to be more to life than mm -hmm. the nine to five, the kids thing, the holiday. Thing. A midlife crisis is what we're describing, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, totally. I think and it's a good point. It depends. My feeling is that there's now, like what constitutes midlife crisis was based on what age we were all going to die, but we're all probably going to kick the bucket a bit later. Yeah. So um, maybe this is a bit of a third rail, but it's, it's what I see. I'll see people who've made decisions that they think are irreversible. And this is where it gets interesting because when people think they've made irreversible decisions, that's when I know I'm sort of ahead of them. You might be going down a darker path than you might yeah, think. Uh, so my goal is to stop and say, hang on, I hear the way you're talking. That's not irreversible yeah. at all, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, so for men, it's probably in their 40s. Mm. But it does vary. Yeah. Uh, it depends on you know how quickly the people have moved through the life phases. For women, it seems to come in a, what I would call a bimodal. It's it's you know mid twenties and then later, and they're and they're maybe the women who are struggling to find so you hormones and menopause and all these stuff as well. Kind of has contributes, I presume. Yeah, I, I'm sure that that contributes. In Biological it. clocks ticking and stuff like that. Yeah, like I, to be honest with you, you know what we're talking about. Yeah. I've been feeling a bit like that over the last few uh, months. Like yeah. the days, especially with, over during the summer, now where. You know, the weather has been terrible, the days are rolling into each other. It's like, I'm 10 years away from addiction now, you know, I have yeah. my all my education and my belt, yeah. work experience and stuff like that. But then you're thinking, like, is that it? Is that Aye. it? Like, what yeah, the yeah, fuck? Yeah. Like, is there something? Is there something? Why, that's why I'm looking forward for the summer to be over, to September to start. I know, I know it's a rat race and it's going to be busy and all that, but it's like, I'll have struck, I don't know. I'm lacking a bit of structure, mm -hmm. a bit of uh, missing those goals, you know, mm -hmm. that, you're, that you're talking about. Yeah. Because uh, I'm thinking about myself as you're speaking. I think mm -hmm. like maybe I need I need more goals, need another challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, I need something to kind of light a fire under me. You know. Mm -hmm. It's having having something in both camps. I I like to say to people, not either or both and. So it could be have all the structure, have the goals in place, but this is where. It, the, that's the nuts. The way I talk about, it, we need the nuts and bolts, and we need to run in parallel the woo woo. Mm. <laughs> and that's yeah, yeah, that's yeah. been my discovery from legally taking psychedelics and saying that the, you can have all the goals and achieve and achieve and achieve all the things that you want, but that feeling of wholeness is not outside. It's it's in here, mm. and it's a four letter word, and it's love. Mm. It's self love. Mm. So, I check in with so in that regard so i suppose people if sometimes i've come across a lot of people who are out of active addiction or, or some major thing that was really holding them back and then they do sort of look over their shoulders and go is this it mm. and yeah. where i learned that my first point of port of call is like and where in your life both practically spiritually emotionally whatever way you want to hit it are you going i'm I'm a worthwhile individual, the same as the next person, and how much... In, so there's external validation, which is not to be sneezed at, but there's that internal validation, and it's saying, how can I increase my own sense of compassion that comes totally with inside myself? It doesn't rely on anybody else saying, well done, or you got this degree, or you got yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Self-compassion piece is, in a way, unfortunate. I don't think it makes Irishmen particularly comfortable. It's not something mm -hmm. we're good at. 
Mm. We're not conscious. It takes time. It takes time. But let's be honest, it's it's the money shot. Mm. And I'll tell you a wee story of a fella in, in recovery. So when I was working in rehab, it was big rehab in Thailand. You'd have some people who would use it almost like a, a you know a holiday camp, if I'm honest. You know, they'd be in the revolving door. They were back in and out. Mm. This fella knew the program. Nice guy, but comes in second day. And there was young fellas who were struggling and were really listening. It was their first time. So, you know, I was taking a group session. Uh, we're not angels. We're not perfect. I was getting a wee bit pissed off at him because he was yeah, yeah. around the show. I'm sure yeah. you felt those fellas. Yeah. He was chatting away. He was chatting away. And maybe I shouldn't have done this, but I just interrupted him and, and I knew he had a kid. And I said, right, you know the way the coat wind blows. Do you have a child? He's like, yes. I don't want to say the name of the age or anything, but yeah, do you have a child? If you loved yourself as much as you loved her, would you drink? And he went, no. And then he just thousand yards there. He was quiet for the rest of the session. Yeah. And I wasn't saying it necessarily out of some big masterful stroke. I was just a bit pissed off, you know, but I thought... Yeah. And I didn't, it's sometimes as a therapist, and this again might sound spooky, you start to say things and you go, Fuck, I may be touching a boundary here, but it's like an ethical responsibility that you have to that person to say, mm. I'm not giving you advice here, but I need to tell you what is coming up for me right now, because yeah. I think it might be deeply, potentially deeply hurtful, but it's maybe deeply helpful. It's, if it's a wee bit more helpful than it is hurtful, mm. I want to take that chance and maybe, say it to you. that's what he needed to. He needed that. He was looking mirror yeah. up and he could see and, himself, was, and, I didn't, and he didn't like it. And so, yeah, and that, to talk about the point, one very p powerful exercise that yeah. fellas can do is, it's called Hopano, I think, and uh, stand in the mirror, look at yourself yeah, and say, I, it's some, something along the lines of, I love you, I forgive you, I'm yeah. sorry, something like yeah. that. That's it. And I used to get the lads in, in the uh, group sessions because we had male and female yeah. group sessions. <laughs> and I'd say, right, lads, Look at each other, pair up, and you say, oh, here we go. Look at each other in the eyes for, for a minute. And I had to put a timer, lads, in, in the middle of my phone, because, you know, it's from all over the world, but there'd just be these screams. It was like I was asking them to do, you know, 100 burpees or something. After about 20 seconds, they're going, that's a minute, that's a minute. Yeah, it was difficult, didn't it? <laughs> because they were having to, and I said, but you just have to check in with that. So you can run away from that all you want, and that is... All roads lead to Rome in that regard. I don't know what you, that's maybe that, not so very scientific. No, no, but it's a very, 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 very valid point. Uh, okay, because at the beginning of my own recovery, yeah. I couldn't even look in the mirror. Uh, I looked in the mirror and I absolutely had no idea who this person was. I didn't know what his favorite color was. I didn't know what music he liked. I didn't know nothing about him. I didn't, I wasn't able to express emotions i didn't know what they were i knew too sad and happy and that was it mm -hmm. i started looking in the mirror every single day i started telling myself Do you know what i love you you know i didn't feel it mm -hmm. no today Aye. i look in the mirror and i say i feel it Aye. and i have my phone my phone is there mm -hmm. do you know what my screenshot is what? picture of me Aye. We're not but comfortable with that. I'm culturally me for me. myself. Me and, too. And every and it's I'm making a <laughs> funny picture face. you on me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so what my dad say to me, you know, if you were a lollipop, you'd lick yourself. <laughs> but you know, but that's that's, but that's, that's far, so far from it. It's, oh no, I I shouldn't so, have said I I, I agree yeah, with you. It's, it's so far from me being because I'm not vain. Or, no, no. Yeah. I love myself yeah. internally, yeah. not externally. Yeah. I love myself because I love. Me, we are. Uh, you know, in every single part of me, yeah. you know, I mess up at times. Yeah. I don't kill myself anymore like I used to before. Yeah. That picture just, for me, I just put it up there. It was a funny face. I showed my wife the, 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 the screensaver. I said, what do you think of my new screensaver? She looked at me and she says, what the fuck is that? I said, you know what? Uh, Why not? But you... Why not? Do you know what, lads? Whenever I think about, uh, uh, like, I'm sure everybody who's, um, loads of people on this podcast who've been through the recovery journey, I value, I'm actually going to use that word, when they tell me the stories of, you know, we were, you know, his dad was beating the shit out of him and, you know, this was just going wrong and that bad thing had happened to me. We all met around the back of the petrol station and we experienced love, not just for each other, but, Mm. for ourselves for the first time I'm like 
Like that's your first group therapy session. <laughs> right now, culturally, <laughs> that gets beaten out of us a wee bit. Yeah. But if you don't, the other thing about loving yourself is it's not just a nice thing to do or something which helps with mental health. It's so much wider than that. You cannot really be say love your wife if you don't love yourself because she, she can't reciprocate her love and it's a two-way street. Yeah. Your kids as well. That's the news story is, so you actually have a moral and I would even fucking go as far to say like a cosmic responsibility to love yourself. Now, I know how uncomfortable that will make people feel the sentence. You have a cosmic responsibility to love yourself. It doesn't mean I don't believe it in my bone marrow and having had legal psychedelic experiences made me go, I, I think I feel that. I think that's true enough mm -hmm. to go, no, do you know what? I'm quietly confident enough to stand on, on a podcast and say, I believe it wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it cure people from the inside out. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. if there's anything else curative, like let me know. So it doesn't matter whether it's hypnosis or breath work or whatever. Mm -hmm. These are all keys into the same thing or psychedelics for that matter. Mm -hmm. It's being able to look in the mirror and mean it and say, I love myself. And that doesn't, mean that the things that I do are any more acceptable. And I'm sure we all have things in our rear view mirror yeah. that you're not proud of. Mm. But even if that person doesn't forgive me, it doesn't mean that my love is not conditional on the love of another person. Mm. It's, it's Which just- Which you know the risk that people might be uh, thinking about, yeah, yeah. no. And I, yeah. if you can only get, get that love for yeah. yourself while under the influence of that psychedelic, uh, then you ch you're chasing that because right. you don't, you know, so how, how do we integrate sure. that love where you don't need the psychedelic to yeah, feel yeah. It, it, it? The psychedelic gives you the experience, so you know, yeah, you know it's agreed. there and you're yeah, capable. The, there's a there there. Yeah, you know, uh -huh. so now you know it's there, but how do we get that without taking the psychedelic uh, in the longer time? Because uh, we can't all be taking LSD every Tuesday or we won't oh. get anything done. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my, my kitchen wouldn't get put in, but um, that's a really good question. And I think that's the million dollar question. So I'm just going to speak from personal experience. The, ex the psychedelic experience I'm talking about for, for, you know, because I'm conscious, you know, that I am a mental health professional yeah. in Australia. And we'll bring our partner on our next. Yeah, lockdown. and she talk about yeah, that. So yeah. I, I, I did that legally. I'm thinking, okay, how do I recapitulate that in my day-to-day -day life? And I'll tell you one place where I did feel it. We, I used to live in London and there's a group, big shout out to them called the House Gospel Choir. They are and it does what it says on the tin house music which is very strongly linked if i'm honest with certain yeah. you know, substances oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it makes more sense post you know post hoc but they sing gospel music over the top of that so i sang with them they're a fantastic outfit and there was a few times when you know you're just in amongst people 100 people singing the dj's up there the full band there and you know and you feel it you feel it yeah. You know what I'm you're talking about? And you're going, you feel it. You feel it. You just right. feel it. So I'm thinking, yeah. from, so let's get a wee bit technical about it. Any substance, compound, someone comes on, this is this compound. It only works in your body because it has a receptor site that is already there. So this is not woo, -woo this is material. Yeah. So you have to find a way, that's an exogenous, that's from yeah. outside of yourself. The goal is to find ways to endogenously produce that. And for me, it is, um, singing it is getting out in nature as much as i possibly can and i now live in perth hills for that very reason mm -hmm. um and you know i'm just about shy off going i go for runs and you think you never know i might give that tree a hug in the future you know uh, I, I don't get yeah. shit to say that yeah. and it's also the the payload for me there is no substance on on earth that is going to come anywhere near to holding my wee boy in my hands yeah do you know what i mean yeah. and and I, th I thank those breakthrough experiences for recalibrating me enough but the work is on me every day that ends in a way to recapitulate that. So I think a lot of people yeah. will think, oh, these substances addictive. No, they're not. Mm -hmm. And also people with any ounce of common sense are going to ask that, pose that question to themselves, and then they're going to start to band together and figure out ways to get within spitting distance of that mm -hmm. without any of the side effects or without having to break the law, even if it is legal. They are not the be all and end all. They are a portal into something which we all knew already. Yeah. And we are a yeah. religious society. Yeah. So psycho-spiritual transformation happens. It's real. It can happen in the church. It can happen in the, in the middle of a fucking DJ with car cocks going bananas. And yeah. it happens. But you have to look for it in a way that suits you. And then you have to... And it's on your... Every day you open your eyes, it's your responsibility to find that in yourself and other people. You mentioned something there around being a religious society, which traditionally we were, but maybe not anymore. Uh, fair but enough. Maybe, maybe 
maybe there's a problem in that. Maybe because we are a deeply spiritual beings yeah. throughout history. We've always had gods. We've wor worshipped pagans here yeah. in Ireland and right. Christianity, like, but not so much anymore. Mm -hmm. But now the god is becoming the consumer society and materialistic stuff. It's not. It's not, it's not fulfilling people. Yeah. And like maybe we're missing that religious side of it or that spiritual side of it. Aye. And a psychedelic substance helps you reconnect with that. Totally. There's in a way, a PlayStation or a big TV or a phone won't. It doesn't. Everybody, we all know the answer to that. But then I think the, the trick of the mind is you go, you know, you hear the, the, the multi-millionaire, whatever. The thing that you're actually aspiring for and they're on a podcast or whatever saying, <laughs> I've never been so miserable as when I had all those yeah. things. The wee trick that our minds plays to go, now that's him. If it was me, I'd be different. Yeah. He wouldn't. Aww. So there's a fella, I forget his name, but he talks about how the model of, you know, the standard model in therapy is biopsychosocial. Yeah. Fancy term for, you know, body, mind, soul. Yeah. Or you know, body, mind relationships. Yeah. And the spiritual sort of gets put in, you know, maybe if as an afterthought, but he talks about the biopsychosocial spiritual. Mm. It's actually four elements. Yeah. Now, it's an uncomfortable term for some people, but. You have to, you have to. So when some people come to me and they say, "I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm doing, I'm getting my ten thousand steps, and you know, I'm going to the meetings or whatever it may be. It doesn't have to be in yeah. recovery. I'm doing all of the things. Why do I still have that missing piece?" I say, "I do not know the answer to that question, but you do. Yeah, and it's not going to be found in the next set of reps, or the next TV you buy, or the next person, even spiritually stuck." Yeah. Spiritually stuck, and then you get the people who do the spiritual bypass, where they think they've climbed to the top of the mountain, and they haven't. It's a, they've they've they're they're presenting themselves as though they've got there, but that's a messy, non-linear, pers deeply personal journey, and how that tessellates with the faith of your fathers or whatever you find out in the world. That, I think that's for people hopefully listening to go. Maybe I'm hopefully making people think. Well, where where is that element? Because. Mm. that's usually the element where people are struggling with that I work with because they yeah. can't look at the other things and say, oh, well, if only I had a few more quid or, you know, yeah. X, Y, and Z. It's, it's usually that, to be honest. So um, so this this is a little bit I've gotten from psychedelics in the mm -hmm. past. Yeah. Um, ayahuasca, mm -hmm. San Pedro, and um, other stuff. Yeah. Okay. You will get a feeling from the plant medicines that will show you how you should always feel. Yeah. It'll give you the full extent of love, of of kindness, of compassion, you know, of care for yourself. It'll give you that glimpse of how every single human being should feel and what's there for us. And the thing with society is we don't feel that stuff because a lot of us are molded into feeling bad because of our upbringings and all these different things. So. It's up to you to get a place in your own life. And what you'll have to do is find what works for you. Absolutely. It might be therapy. It might be meditation. It might be just a lot of different retreats, plant medicine retreats, meditation retreats, silent retreats, all these different things. It's not about looking at one thing and saying, fuck, um, I, I didn't get nothing from that. Mm -hmm. Trust me. You will get something from everything. Yeah. It's about continuing on that road and finding what works for you, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it's a, it's about moving further and further and further into your own kind of true self, where you feel much better about yourself and you get to a place that's bringing you closer to a place where there's non-judgment on yourself, non-judgment on other situations, and it doesn't matter if you're a multi-millionaire or you have the price to go in and buy a loaf of bread. Yeah. You will have this built-in capacity to love yourself and not care about anything or how anybody thinks about you or feels anything about you. And that's and that's where we, we're trying to get to. Yeah. But we're in a place at the moment in life where we've never, ever had this much, um, what would you call it, um, guidance mm -hmm. in how to reach these places because we have social media, we have the internet, 
and there's so much there. It's about finding the right one because there's a lot of bullshit out there too. Uh, there's a lot of you know, signal, it's, it's, noise to the signal. And it's about finding the right people yeah. and listening and just keep listening and just keep moving on to the next step. Access access to information yeah. is brings us problems. Is filtering the information then is the next thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. There's there's uh, there's no shortage of information out there. Um, and like I say, it's it's an important piece, but I almost think of it like. You know, if you've got a dead battery, you need someone to jumpstart you, but it's not going to drive the car onwards. It's the, what is your personal engine that's going to get you from yeah. A to B? It's, it's not more information. It's like, for want of a better word, it, it probably is more love and you, and you have to charity begins at home. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> putting in the work. Yeah. Almost. Putting in the work. Yeah, absolutely. It's not just going to come to you. Yeah. Psychedelics will show you what's there for yeah. you. But they're not the be all and end all. Definitely the not. Be all and end all is deep in here, and it's about mm. you sitting with yourself yeah. and bringing that up. Yeah, and that's yeah. where it is. That's where I get. Yeah. Now, pleasure talking to you. Yeah. If people want to say how you get in touch, how can they do that? Yeah, I have a I have a podcast about psychedelic science. It's called the Mind Manifest Podcast .com. I have links there through to if they want to see me for, you know, telehealth or or anything like that. And I have a contact page. I'll respond to all the emails. But I'm very curious to see what, if, and also for, if there's people who are saying, oh, you know, we misspoke about that or I would disagree. I especially like that, you know, because I certainly don't have all the answers, but yeah. we're all in a space to, to, to get better. So it's Mind Manifest yeah. podcast. We've had some good, yeah. good guests on in this space and we're moving more, hopefully towards the end of the year into thinking about live events because really as great as digital media is a, a 2d world's grand but i like people you know what i mean yeah, better. <laughs> yeah. so I, I, but what can what can yeah. people expect if yeah. they do tune into the, yeah. your podcast yeah or well can they get can they get a, a better understanding of psychedelic yeah absolutely we i mean i we've spoken a little bit more broadly about it but i will focus a little bit more on specific topics with you know, thought leaders in the space. So we've had Amanda Fielding, uh, Michael Pollan, uh, Ben Sess, we did an event with him, uh, Jeremy Tannenbaum, so psychiatrist. So I've worked a lot more yeah. with those people who know what they know yeah. in, in their specific field because it's, it's a wildly complicated field. Mm -hmm. So I'm just piecing my way through it. Yeah. Try and, I just try and, trying to figure out, you know, research is my search, I suppose. So yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah. yeah. And they've all been on Netflix as well. They've ah, uh, yeah. And they're doing psychedelic, uh, um, series and, and, totally. and, and stuff. if there's any links or whatever, you know, to stuff that I think yeah. I'll, I'll send through to you, you Paul, lads yeah. to, to give people if they want to do deep dive on this because we've really only scratched the surface on just you know? <laughs> yeah. some stuff is too deep, ah, yeah, you know, yeah, for absolutely. beginners' ears, yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, listen, thank you so much, yeah, uh, thanks, been a uh, pleasure and a privilege, and I love what you're doing, thanks very much, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Listen, it's time for part two, <laughs> bring <laughs> yeah. on your wife, yeah. so thanks, man. no problem, thank you. We just go straight straight on, but you want to just go 